Um, welcome to the first and last word poetry series. And Harris Gardner and I um, welcome you. And I'm going to turn it over to Harris uh, to get us all started. So Harris, uh, take it away. Here we go. We're going in alphabetical order. Um, you, you all are going to hear some wonderful poetry tonight. I guarantee that. I know all the features and they are well known. They almost don't need any introduction, but still as a courtesy, I will introduce each one individually. Doug Holder is the founder of Ibison Street Press and the co-president of the New England Poetry Club. Holder is the arts editor for the Somerville Times and teaches creative writing literature at Endicott College. His work has appeared widely in the small press including the Worcester Review, so that Rattle, Molecule, Lips, and many more. The Doug Holder Papers Collection is an archive to the University of Buffalo Libraries. For over 30 years, Holder ran poetry groups for psychiatric patients in the McLean Hospital. I give you Doug Holder. You hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me to read at the first and last word poetry series, Harris and Gloria. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I'll start reading. I'll read a few poems. Um, and, you know, anyone who's teaching now still um, knows that there's the new thread of uh, the AI uh, uh, chat box where we're writing papers and students are using those papers. And also, a long time problem in the classroom has been texting. So this one is called texting in class. They're like gymnasts tapping below their waist, a resplendent smile to their crotch. Their heads bob up and down, a restless buoy. I call on them, they smile with cunning innocence. With sleight of hand, they slip it clandestinely into a pants pocket. Something is up their sleeve. There's always a tapping subtext in class. My commentary lost on their coded text. It should be on the syllabus, this game of cat and mouse. But their bodies shake when they are not on firm ground. The um, next poem is I Don't Know Why. Uh, it speaks to my, you know, growing up in New York City and, you know, as a boy in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s and I'm attracted to that period of time I don't know why I don't know why I have visions of elevated tracks subways defiantly roaring at the dark damaged men pointing costume jewelry for cheap redemption legless men on wheeled carts can you spare a fin after all, he was a former choir boy. The patrician slap of the old gray lady on the pavement outside the newsstand. A sign on a city street. Sid Klein's Fatman shop. Men in black overcoats. Clandestine girth hidden behind their draping body armor. The sliding hot glass over the polished wood. Monk straight no chest chaser in the background. The summer street. A kid throws his radio out of a Bronx tenement window. The Yankees went south in the 10th. A man at Ratner's whose life has been reduced to yelling at a round-shouldered waiter. You call this a pickle? The neon's ironic wink. All the sound and fury must signify something. And this is uh, one I did uh, take off on Allen Ginsberg supermarket in California. Who wept in the lettuce? Who bludgeoned the chuck, chuck roast? Who walked down the soup line like Andy Warhol? Who squeezed the avocado for a green plume of passion? Who tried to save the lobster from its Auschwitz tank? Who held the pale flesh of the halibut to his or her beckoning breast? Who will unfreeze all this ice? And this is for my uh, late wife, Diane, layer of blankets. 
In a dream, she came to me. And she had to peel off a layer of blankets. Hot towels were wrapped tightly around my face. I could barely breathe. She struggled as she always did, but like some force of nature, she ripped them off me. I could feel the sudden rush of air, the brush, the brush of her luxury and hair. I will always be with you. I will always be there. Some time ago, I noticed a, uh, a, um, a video of, a, of um, cats in a sort of ritually circling a dead cat in the middle of a suburban street. Um, and so I wrote a poem about that. A shocked pink flamingo stares from a well-trimmed lawn as they endlessly circle in this black mass, tail to tail. They tread for the dead. Worshippers of Satan, birds of a dark, nefarious, ominous feather that endlessly stick together around this totem of a splayed black cat. No toil or trouble will burst this ritual's bubble. Many of you have been poetry publishers and um, 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 uh, know of the poet, the prolific poet, uh, Lynn Lishvin, who used to send hundreds of poems, you know, and you know, in one submission. And um, I wrote a poem for, for a memorial of her for Lips Magazine. So it's Lis Lynn Lishvin, Old West Church, Boston. And you with your red-faced mini skirt, you're, and you with your face red mini skirt, high heels reading at the state, old Brahmin Boston church, John Wieners beside you looking like a brother of Erwin Corey, newspapers spouting like leads, like weeds from the sides of a decaying blue blazer. You were a poet of the well-stuffed envelope full of poems about your mother, the cats, their nocturnal wanderings coming back at dawn like wayward lovers. A woman of long hair and a floppy hat, graceful like a dancer. She reminds us of friends, girlfriends of our past, we drift in, but seldom last. And here uh, was a poem I wrote about um, when I was uh, contemplating years ago whether to move to stay in New York or, or, or um, uh, uh, leave to Boston. I was in Washington Square Park. In, in, in Greenwich Village in New York. I was here, there, nowhere, sitting with a crumpled bag of cherries in Washington Square, far from the Midtown Tunnel in a suburban bubble. I watched the Greenwich Village live stream, junkies, poseurs, three con Monty, shysters, closet queens, people of means, fashion queens. I thought I'd get a room in the Washington Square Hotel Heard Dylan Baez once lived there. Cheap digs, a garret of a writer, not yet bloomed. I was here, there, nowhere, looking across at the old man on a bench, fenching mine with a bag of crumpled cherries. He stared at me and I at him amidst the Harker's den. He seemed like he never left that bench. It sort of suited him. I got up and walked under the triumphal arch to Boston. I gathered of a room. The cherries were pits in my stomach. And the final poem um, was, in, was in recently in Constellations, uh, a magazine that came out by um, Nina Rubenstein. Uh, Nina. Okay. Um, let's see what is that. Excuse me. Here it is, 69. And it was about my time at a mental hospital. as I worked at McLean Hospital for many years. On the psychiatric ward, all rise. From the psychiatric ward with the cigarette haze of confusion, the blathering and the dithering and the blithering, voices broken by age, a tower of babel, nasal in the guttural, the whines of chaos, comes a stentorian voice, a sharp whip of authority, loud, prominent, august. All rise. A judge, perhaps, some Cicero among a ship of fools. I saw a hollow man, legs like thin winter branches, a caved-in chest, as if someone sucker-punched him with a lead pipe, taking a drag on his cigarette and repeated, 
our eyes, our courtroom with the mentally ill, levitated for a moment above the ward, the swirl of nefarious smoke. We all silently pleaded guilty. So surely we will all rise once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Um, Doug sees the world with a gimlet eye. <laughs> anyway. Um, and next, that was wonderful poetry, Doug. Thanks very much. Thank you. Everybody can hear me, right? Okay. Our next uh, reader in alphabetical order is uh, Gary Metras. And uh, Gary um, uh, had, for years, he had a press called Ad Astra. And was um, uh, published the old way. And anyway, um, his poems have appeared in such periodicals as America, The Common, Ibsen Street, Poets. His newest of eight books of poems as Vanishing Points, uh, published by Dos Madres Press in 2021, was selected as the 2022 must read poetry title in the Massachusetts uh, Books of the Year program. His new book, Marble Dust, is from Shavana Baba Press. Please welcome Gary Metras. Thank you, thank you. And Gloria and Harris, thank you for uh, inviting me to this. I've Always enjoyed uh, uh, your whole program here. Now, this first one I'm going to read is uh, from Marble Dust, my, my new book. Another Winter. Old Tom, mountain beyond the backyard, sleeps like a titan. For you, this is just another winter. The snow numbs, the wind chafes. Dream is your retreat. The valley you sprang from has been measured, marked, cut and built on as if there was nothing else for men to do. When the snow comes, where will those boundaries be? Your flank was hacked out like a tumor so we could ski in our health. An antenna is your crown, blinking the night long journey we think will last eternity. The scrub pine bend under snow. You hardly flinch in your waiting in a deep mystery of your stone. The land would be barren without your height, like a boy with no father or man without God, a monotony beyond us all. When the snow melts, sluicing down your wind sculpted side, a few more trees will be cut, a foundation or two dug to gape with the emptiness hopes are built from. And then new neighbors who will look at you in June deliciousness and wonder what to do with time while you attend all the winters to come. I live uh, right beneath a, a little bit tall mountain here in Western Massachusetts, and that's what that inspired that poem. This is another one from that book called Lint. Uh, Gentlemen, don't reach in your pockets right now to see if there's any lint on the bottom of it. There probably is, but that's okay. This poem is called Lint, and it comes from that experience. It doesn't bother me to have lint in the bottoms of pant pockets. It gives the hand something to do, especially since I no longer hold shovel, pod, or hammer in the daylight hours of labor and haven't, in fact, done so in 55 years. A long time to be picking lint from pockets perhaps even long enough to have gathered sacks full of lint <laughs> that could have been put to good use, maybe spun into yarn to knit a sweater for my wife's Christmas present, or strong thread woven into a tweedy jacket. Imagine entering my classroom in a jacket made from lint. Who would believe it? Yet there are stranger things, 
the son of a bricklayer with hands so smooth they're only fit for picking lint. <laughs> now, here's the last poem in that book. It's called Engineering Sweet Dreams. It's for my granddaughter. But I ate my son-in-law's last mint chocolate after a cigarette. It was the last one. He will not be pleased, but won't say so. I'll let the chocolate sit on the tongue, slowly vanishing, the way morning fog slips between trees and is gone, until all that remains is a memory made sweet by the play of sunlight. Or the way saying, I love you, disappears into a kiss. But what else could I do? It was time to give my granddaughter her noon bottle. When I snuggle and feed her, do you think she wants the stale tobacco on my breath or the aroma of chocolate? She doesn't know either, but we want her dreams to be sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Harris. Hmm. Uh, out here in Western Mass, believe it or not, I'm known as the fly fishing poet, and I've published two books of uh, fly fishing poems. This is one of them, River Voice 2. Uh, and I'm going to read the uh, basically the title poem of this book here. Sometimes when I stand in a river, fly rod in hand, pausing between casts, water whispers to me. Tie on a small dark fly, the midges will soon hatch, and you remember how, in, how insatiable is the trout's appetite. Wait a little more upstream. There's a hidden upswell that trout circle because bugs use it to climb to the light. Can you feel my thirst to join the deep currents in the ocean? But even now, that is where I journey, while you stay here, rooted to this river. But know, too, the flux of your existence washed downstream, like sediment to deposit somewhere else to feed other life, other dreams. Sometimes this voice seems floating on the air or twisting leaves and trees but I know it is water speaking to me. And always, always, I listen to what water says and go where water goes. This one combines my two loves of fly fishing and, uh, and poetry. The Strand of Partridge Feather. And I... I opened the poem with a, with a line from the, the poet Tom Sexton. And his line is, this poem, this flicker is all I can offer. So here's my poem. The pleasure of small tasks, tying some trout flies, reading some pages of a friend's new book of poems. I pick up a pencil to mark a line beautifully formed and stuck to the knife sharpened point, a single strand of partridge feather clinging to the graphite. Some forces need be unseen, the way words can bypass the mind and adhere to the heart. Five flies, five poems, just enough. I'll read a couple from uh, my Chavita Barber Press, uh, Captive in Here, which is published in 2018. Home for the new year. Already a night without freeze. Already half my neighbors darkening their homes as if, as if they realized there was no second coming, just another holiday of small joys. The world going on as before. Those who desire murder, murder. Those dreaming of love, settle for babies. We speak of tsunami and roadside bombs. How unpredictable it is. But people, though weary, will walk into another year of their skin, will plant rice and gourds, and in time will sing again the poems of the grandfather. Hmm. This poem is called Inheritance and starts off with the, a line from uh, W.H. Auden. The line is To undo. The, the faded lies, inheritance. 
Somewhere in the cave of the brain, cells that sleep emit others swollen and stimuli. The body consumes, the emptiness remains. Monsters are made gods, believed in, surrendered to. If the body kneels and bows the hours, it feeds the fear. If the body bleeds someone else's greed, redemption evaporates. If the body's direction is the path worn into the earth by others, courage drowns in the noise of boots marching, marching. It is this vibration caused the somnific dancing. Brain cells asleep claim their birthright in dream. The body's conquered sensation smile, knowing those cells will not sleep forever. I read a couple from my, my uh, newer upcoming book uh, called Marble Dust. And that book is, uh, I suppose, say memories and stories from uh, various European trips and travels that I've taken. Uh, and this is coming uh, up from uh, Tribuna Barber Press. Marble Dust. These are the shoes I wore to walk the Acropolis in Athens. I propped the foot on the Parthenon step to place my eyes within the cold glow of marble to better trace the column's curve up to the pediment and the cobalt sky beyond empty of clouds of gods. Empires and deities come and gone. All those orations, the pledges, the routine, the grandiose, evaporated, circling, invisible above us, men and marble, one temporary, one a truth revealed. Plato and Phidias, Pericles and Archimedes, all dust that I carry lovingly on these shoes. If you, if you if you go to natural history museums or archaeological museums, you see all these little doodads everywhere behind glass on shelves and everything else. And I came across this one at the Athens uh, Archaeological Museum. And the title of the poem is the title of that little artifact. And it's number 4729, Silver Diadem with Dentilated Border. This small crown, tarnished by age, so that no gleam shines through the glass display, rests with a dozen other artifacts, shards of pottery, clay fingerings, figurines, mostly broken, and simple twists and coils of thin gold, earrings, brooches, pins, all time-stained, redeemed from Cyclades' earth and reduced to catalog number. This crown exists without history, without metaphor. It is itself nothing more. But some father had wealth and love enough to order this crown, to place it on a daughter's head and smile at her new beauty, which she, princess now, wore strolling the island's agora above the rocky shore and stopping to stare into the Aegean mist, where her dream of love continued, him sailing through storm swells, blown from island to island toward her without knowing this destiny she desired. Each day she added more to the story, stared longer into ankle-deep sea. Each day she prayed, first Artemis, then Aphrodite. Each day he drew closer in her heart, but Herodotus is silent. She is without Homer, no Sophocles, no God-shaped swan enfolded her in feathers, no lyric entrusted to memory and chanted at annual festival with song and sacrifice. No likeness in marble with bare shoulders or breasts curving to shape imaginations. No treasure on earth with her bones. Not even bones. Just a diadem on a glass shelf. Dentilated. Grown darker each year. But once there was a dream larger than an island. And standing on shore, a girl with dawn light sprinkled in her crown. Hmm. Here's the last one, Stealing Troy. Now, this poem is actually a four-part poem. I'm going to read just part two. Stealing Troy. Wind in the cypress, in the wild olive, laughing at honor, at flesh and bone, 
at their delusion of permanence. Grass and wildflower germinating into whitening cracks and fissures of Troy, its stones split, charred, scattered. Marble columns buried and broken like stone worms, breathless, unable to undulate. Marble walks smothered in upheaved earth and vegetation, only jawbone of cat, tibia of mouse, whitened on the ground. Blame the lichen, this gradual millennial meal on stone, the grains of sand blowing from seashore to explode on stone. Troy fallen to blood, to fire, to disguise avarice for the greater good of Agamemnon and all of that. Nine times Troy rose and fell to anger, to pestilence, to erosion, to the cloudy memory of men. Look, Aphrodite dancing her jealous dance on Mount Ida with her one promise for the one boy tending his father's sheep. Look, Helen dancing the fire dance in the temple about to fall as she succumbs again as plaything of men and gods. Look, Sophia Schliemann adorned in a glittering gold, posing and dancing for her husband's delight and desire. Once the walls were golden in the sunset, once the sea shimmered against the plains, but withdrew the horror of tides without Aminusis. Tides of blood and wailing rose and fell in the breast swell of women dancing their desperation, dancing into destiny. City and field deserted, plundered. Walk in the ruins of Troy today and feel the years themselves crumbling through the heart. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, Gary. Our, um, our third uh, featured poet is um, uh, Joyce Wilson. And um, she is the editor of the Poetry Porch a literary magazine on the internet since 1997. Her poems have appeared in many literary journals, among them Free Inquiry, Salamander, The Lyric, and Poetry Ireland. Her chapbook, The Need for a Bridge, and a full-length collection, Take and Receive, were both published in 2019. Please welcome Joyce Wilson. Thanks very much, Harris and Gloria and Gary and Doug. This is really a great opportunity to read as always. Um, I'm going to read uh, mostly new work and uh, it's gonna be in two sections. I have some serious poems and some in a lighter vein. So I'll begin with the serious ones. I call these uh, part of my social justice project. And um, the first is about the death or written after the death of Michael Brown. What I heard that day on the news, Ferguson, Missouri, August 9th, 2014. I heard the mother of Michael Brown speak up. Her neighbor stood beside her, holding her to keep her from falling into the crowds so that she would not be denied the chance to tell about her son who lay nearby. She asked us, do you know how hard it was? Do you know how hard it was to keep my son in school, to get him to finish, to tell him it was good to graduate? 12 years of classes, diploma, and then, do you know how hard it was for him to do the work for credit and degree? where praise is private for the family. Do you know how hard that it is, she cried, to educate a young black man in this small town of Ferguson in Missouri, where city planning schemed to drive us out from downtown affluence and jobs and stores to suburbs where we couldn't work, couldn't drive, couldn't shop and couldn't leave we have the village here to raise this child. We have his mother here, his teachers here. Police are here, the law is here. 
Do you know how very hard that it was, she cried, to tell him that he shouldn't lie, decide each day to make his effort worth a try, to eat his breakfast, take the test, to rest? Do you know how hard it was, she cried? He had the motivation and the pride. He worked for that diploma, and then he died. <clears throat> that moment. <clears throat> uh, this poem ends with the word cleft from Rock of Ages. Cleft for me, I want cleft to me in a space. That moment, that moment, a monument, that soul, a breath, that outcome, an argument, that body bereft, that moment of memory, that stone, a cleft. And the next poem appeared recently in Constellations. It's called The Best Mango in Senegal. It's um, informed by my experience teaching in Senegal, West Africa, when I became friendly with the cook of, at the faculty housing. The Best Mango in Senegal. She was hired to cook for the American faculty, of which I was one. I had been hired to teach a semester's worth of English in two weeks. We had our work cut out for us, as the saying goes. The day that she asked if I would like a mango, she applied her best effort, her love of food and serving it. She cut the wobbly green ovoid in half and removed the center stone, flipping the ripe interior out and over the skin creating a convex moon of delicious orange yellow, which she scored with a knife to make square segments that popped onto the spoon and into my mouth. The juices pooled on my tongue and lifted my senses to zing with sweet, sublime nourishment. This is not like the mangoes we get in the States, I said. She smiled and nodded. I worried that she took too much care her expression as she prepared the native fruit, her brow furrowed in concentration, her application of the knife with such skill, then the open smile with which she presented the edible tropical pleasure on a plate with a spoon and napkin. Who among us deserves such service? How hopeful we both must have been for reward, recognition, better job, better pay at that place where we took on the work cut out for us by someone else other than ourselves and for others that we would hardly know. Portrait of myself as white moderate. This has an epigraph from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, from his letters in Birmingham jail, from Birmingham jail. I am worried about the white moderate studied the film Birth of a Nation, its invention of the split screen that gave three images at once, side by side, but only one perspective. Did not know about the original 33 until I read Margaret Walker's Jubilee. Did not see town planning, city planning, and urban renewal as euphemisms for racism until the murder of George Floyd in 2020 did not know the difference between Greenwoods, Greenwood, Mississippi, Greenwood, Oklahoma, Byron de la Beckwith's Greenwood, Ralph Ellison's Greenwood. How many Tallahatchie rivers are there? Until 2021, did not know about the 1921 Tulsa massacre or the ones in Forsyth, Georgia or Elaine, Arkansas. How many more that I do not know? Uh, the next poem was inspired by an article in The Atlantic. Um, this is about um, the incident with Emmett Till. And um, I read that some lawyers were going to arrest or question the woman who was at the center of the whole atrocity. And so I got to thinking about the woman's role in the whole thing. Um, and this form that I found 
it uh, kind of takes on a um, sequence of events that seem unstoppable. And this appeared in Ibbotson, or it's going to appear in Ibbotson 52. Then Emmett Till. Which of, which of us would believe that women folk do what they have been raised to do, provoke? That Helens everywhere remain unknown until one makes a hero of a drone? Or fans a rumor toward an angry mob, the idle men who jump to do the job? There was an afternoon with time to kill. There was a young man's wife, then Emmett Till. Before he whistled, he was just a boy. Before the crime, there was his mother's joy. Then the verdict from the hapless jury, the open casket, and his mother's fury. And this is the last one in this section called How to Connect with History. And it has material from Roger's Thesaurus and Robert Lowell's poem history, and the uh, French philosopher Michel de Sertou, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, how to connect with history. Others have said it is the crystallization of popular belief, philosophy learned from example, or that it is bunk, or that it is merely gossip. The poet's wife suggested that history is what has happened. The French philosopher wrote that when they move toward what happened and what they said happened, historians make history. Consider the notion that history changes with every reading. The previous lessons were not wrong, just the way they were translated. Yes, you need to know the dates, although they cannot tell you what you should decide. Watch your teachers' faces their need to help you. You might not recognize the dead, but be aware that they can hear you. Absorb what you find on the page. Let yourself fall in love with the heroine, the general, the expanse of time. What use you will make of the story is a matter of emphasis. Unlike writing, history might end, but it is not finished. And that's what I've been working on um, for this new set of poems. And now um, I've also been writing some more um, shorter, humorous, lighter weight ones. Um, this is called Eurydice. It appeared in Muddy River Poetry Review. And I had a chance to sit next to a famous poet and uh, then the reading was over and he walked out and I was following him and I thought, oh, this is what Eurydice must have felt following Orpheus. <laughs> Eurydice. After the reading, I followed you from the darkened auditorium into the light. I wanted to say how much I admired your work just then. Yet if I said too much too soon, I might have persuaded you to turn. And if you turned to look at me, to assess your influence on me, we would have been lost to each other. And chastened by this vanity, I might have doubted what I'd heard. When alone, I'd read your book. The music would unfold itself in shadows that I'd make my own. Hmm. And the next one is a form after Emily Dickinson called Maps. And I'm very much interested in the way she uses personification often. And this was in Ibbotson Street last year. Maps. Maps inspire the traveler where a line of chalk drawn across a mountain range never thought to walk. Maps across the desk veneer cannot feel the points where the worried mountaineer wants to test his joints. Maps are to the calendar what the future tense to the gypsy with an orb hopes will pay her rents. Maps are to the mountaintop as a misty gown or the body underneath leads the climbers on. And I got stuck writing those verses and I wrote a whole lot more verses and most of them I've thrown away, but two of them kind of fit into another poem 
about mountains and these were informed these verses were informed about the myth of the goddess who hides in the mountains and then the um perspective um why do we climb mountains because they are there mm -hmm. mountains mountains hide the goddess that the climbers stirred when the naked girl they saw flew away a bird but that is only true for some and some would say i'm crude for what the climbers long to find is precious solitude mm -hmm. is that true um <laughs> i had um I had Lyme disease in 2015, and I wanted to write a poem to the tick. And um, finally, it's been accepted. It's going to appear in the Hudson Review. Um, it has a precedent to do this to uh, John Donne wrote a poem to a flea, and uh, W.H. Auden wrote a New Year's greeting to all of those yeast, bacteria, and viruses that made his body a habitat so <laughs> so i wanted to um address the tick itself to a dear tick invasive and far flung you made yourself at home then loosed your dreadful tongue to spread your awful foam and raised your cup to toast your intimate the deer a once distinguished host now feverish i fear to make our day complete you left your precious stash, your gift a spirochete, your calling card a rash. How rude of you to die before we'd said goodbye. <laughs> and uh, the last one I'll read um, is a limerick. This was just accepted by Lighten Up Online in the UK. It's going to appear in March. And uh, I took a workshop last spring. We were looking at pages and pages of limericks in all these forms, and I wrote some then polished up a few in December. This is about a whale that's entangled in fishing gear in the New York City Harbor, whale entangled. <clears throat> oh, how it still makes my heart pale to think of the fate of a whale with 4,000 pounds of gear that surrounds its mouth and its torso and tail. Consider the effort it took with cutter and hacksaw and hook and oversized pliers to sever the wires that fishermen dragged and forsook. Three days and they cut the whale free and ushered it out to the sea to swim with the cod and frolic with God who watches or fishes and me. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to all my friends for coming. Great to see you on Zoom.